So, uh, you, you, when we were talking before the episode, you were saying we've got to talk about the Marlins, and it's not necessarily that good because the news in baseball this week is that general manager, Kim Ng, is out uh, in Miami, and that is of her own volition. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, to a degree. Sort of, kind of. Right, because the Marlins <laughs> said they were going to bring in somebody that was going to be a POBO, a president of baseball operations, that would be above her and have decision-making power above her, which would kind of make you, as a general manager, not that important. She said, no, thank you, uh, and now is out there looking for uh, another job actively. And she, I think she turned down, interestingly, the Red, an interviewing for the Red Sox job. Wasn't it a similar situation, though, where they were, she right. was going to be underneath somebody? And so that same thing as would happen if you're a Met fan, thinking about, gee, the Mets need a manager, but we, no, the Mets, we, there's a P, uh, Pobo already there. Right. I think that makes it a little easier, at least in the Mets case, because the Pobo's already there, whereas in like Miami's case, they don't have either one of those now, which but, makes it kind of awkward. But don't you think it's a, bit a question of having the decision-making uh, capacity that she had in uh, in Florida, and now she was going to get less than that in, right. in Miami? Right, and so she, clearly she's not going to go to the Red Sox or the I don't want to be Mets. second banana. Right, she uh -huh. clearly, and she did a good job of building right. her team. They made the playoffs That's the year. thing that bothers me about it more than anything. Like, like what? The, okay, so the team uh, inexplicably makes the playoffs with a rookie manager, this year with a team that we'd all say, I don't know how they did, or at least I would say. Right, and now they're going to, and now the owner, I mean, again, again, it's Jeffrey Loria. Yeah, and now I'm going to put somebody on top of you because you're not quite what we want, or whatever it is you think that is trying to say. So uh, uh, bad job by the Marlins, basically, mm -hmm. is what uh, what comes out there. Uh, still a bright future for for that franchise, though, I think. They've got a lot of nice players. Oh, yeah. So um, after our, our uh, episode last week where we talked about fixing the playoffs, and I think we came to the conclusion that I'm not sure that there's much you can do. Right. right. I think I think they're pretty much they are as they are. I don't think you're going to see much difference other than tinkering with the format. And unless you're going to go to wildly lengthening the playoffs and adding a lot of games, there's not really a way to make them much better than they are right now. I think some of the comments I heard last week was your double elimination in the playoffs was intriguing to some people. <laughs> I, I think I think if if baseball was willing to do that, you could play a Swiss bracket system you could play double elimination and, and then if that was truly about determining who the best t team was that would be it but that would also lead to fatigue because if you ran double elimination you very well could see teams playing repeat series and i don't think that would be right play a team beat, beat a team them. and then have to beat them in a second time right yeah and then, and feel then very baseball where would the it? double <laughs> elimination happen would the double elimination at happen? a neutral site the second right, one right. and how do you do that with an american in a national league because if the double elimination is in the not like in the leagues then you might end up in this weird situation where let's say this year you would have the phillies get to the 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 nlcs and the winner side having beaten the Diamondbacks, and then the Diamondbacks get there. They could then have to play that series twice to determine yeah. who... Like, it, it I understood just, why you came up with the idea, and I think we both... I it's think it's probably it's, not practical it's, ever to be done. It's not practical because it, double elimination works best in games where like you can play the majority of the game the same site. on one day. At, or at the same site. Or at the same site. The problem with this is you would have to play potentially a five or a seven game series travel twice. Travel around and right. Travel back and forth. And like, does anybody really want to watch a seven game series between two teams twice in a row? Yeah. Probably yeah. not. Well, and, and if the object is to try to get I think people are concerned. We want the two best teams. I don't know. That's really important to people. Uh, you know that they they think whatever their perception is with the two best teams. So Joe Posnanski uh, put out this week a kind of a short little history of the of the playoffs and and made the point that from 1903 to 1968, before divisional play started, 100 percent of the time the best team in the league made it to the World Series. Yeah, and that is. Pretty good, you know. There was no not, not much question there, and then we went to the four divisions, and that was on for uh, twenty five years or something like that. Uh, actually, exactly. And two teams advanced sixty two percent of the time. The better team uh, in the league made it to the World Series. Well, that's a pretty big drop up, and now you got another team fighting for it. Uh, and now, in, in after that, in nineteen ninety five, uh, that is right after the strike year to two thousand eleven, uh, four teams advanced in each league thirty five percent of the time. That's kind of interesting. You get a significant drop off there, right? Right, right, and and your point was well, yeah, you know, you, you, it, it's more of a crapshoot. You got two division champions, and not always a team with a better record. Right, and now you have to win two rounds to get into the World Series instead of one. 
So, and, and also that, you know, you would think though that uh, the home team would be the favorite team, but I don't know if that always works out that right. way. I mean, in terms of who has the better record, you still might think a team that isn't and as with good a, a record would, would be better. And with a short initial five game divisional series, you can get blitzed there sometimes against a team that might be super hot playing the wild card team they come ripping into the playoffs on a winning streak they might just catch you off guard that 1973 met team of 50 years ago which just kills me right they were 82 and 79 for the regular season they had to win like a bunch of games from last they came from like last place to get to the division title they beat shocked the reds in a five game series is the point right that these are the soon to be big red machine reds right this is 1973 just before that happens Mm -hmm. and the mets got all the way to the world series and lost in the seventh game but the point is there's your hot team right that Happened. decidedly worse than the other team, you know, all season long and got hot in a five game series and made it happen. Um, in 2012, um, we went to five teams advancing to each um, in, in each league. So we had the two wild card teams playing off to be the fourth team. And then we had a uh, divisional series and then LCS 55% of the time, the, which is really interesting to me. Although when you think about it, two of the teams are knocking each other out. One of the team is out before they even get in. Before, and then it's right back to there. So all it is, is that the number one team, you know, gets to watch the two wild cards battle it out a little bit. But but what happened in the past two years, uh, last year and this year, only 25% of the time, you I know, think the, two, so this is just, it's is it, too short, too it's small. An anomaly, right? right? It's, it's two like, years, and that's way too being like, oh, you know, somebody had an off year, they choked one year. I think you got to let it play out over the course of a bunch of years. I think even with the five-team format, there probably wasn't enough time to gather enough data because it's just too... Well, that was a one-game playoff, too, right? Right. Uh, There's not enough time to really know how much of a difference that made. So since 1969, 55 out of 108 teams with the best record in the league made the World Series are 51%. Okay. That's fine. That's that's fine. I guess, you know, the the idea that you should have the best team. Well, if you want the best team, then just have the two teams with the best record in each league play in the World Series and And let's dispense with everything else. Nobody really wants that. No. So we're going to have the playoffs. No, no. And finally, we've got in this league championship series, or both of them, um, we actually have exciting baseball, right? We were going through a snore fest. It was was (laughs) brutal for the first two games of both LCS series. And even then, the two games following that, the the, the Diamondbacks-Phillies games were... The game three was pretty exciting. Game four went back to a snoozer, but game five was, you know. Both game fives in both series, right? And then they're both 3-2 as we record this on Sunday before game six of the Astros and Rangers. Um, both game fives were really, really right. exciting games. I'm worried for the Rangers tonight. That was a heartbreaking game five loss for them. And we're, we're, you're right about that, and it always has to be Altuve, doesn't it? Right. <laughs> I think the one thing that you could say is if the Rangers can find a way to win tonight, it 180s the situation so hard because I think the fact that the Astros haven't been good at home this year doesn't weigh on their mind in this game. Until they get to game seven and they've lost three games at home. I think that's a good point. If they get to game seven, they've lost three games at home. They've been terrible at home all year. That has to start creeping into the back of your mind way more than it normally would, than it would in game six tonight. So I think... It, it's a this is a very interesting game six because the momentum is so much with the Astros right now. But if they don't put the way the Rangers here, I think it pendulums all the way back to the other side. But we're having these seesaw games, right? So you had the game the night where Abreu hit the three-run home run to give them the the win in Game Four to make uh, so so that, yes, yes, yes. And, and that was a huge play. So you've had these big monumental plays that you didn't have any of those, right? No, you didn't have any of those. And so now I'm hoping for. I, I'm worried because Citizens Bank Ballpark tomorrow night is going to be losing their mind, and I think Merrill Kelly already kind of struggled there in Game Two. I worry they tried to make out like he pitched well in that game. Well, you know, it was a ten nothing game, but he pitched. Well. I don't know right, how you right. can pitch well in a game I, that I, ends I up being ten nothing. Be very worried if you're a D back fan. They've put up a much a better fight than I expected them to because I thought after two games they were dead in the water. But don't you like watching? And I and I said it before the game uh, that the Rangers ended up winning because their bullpen held up in that game. Yeah. And, they, and I kept thinking that their bullpen would fall apart, and the Astros did last night. The Astros bullpen held up and obviously the, in the a six one game. The Ranger bullpen went you know, went down a little bit. So I, I think if you're either team, you're kind of like yeah, we're going to get into that bullpen. It's the same thing in the Philly series, right? The Phillies, you know, bullpen, you get, you got to Kimbrel. You think, ooh, we really got to put him right, out and they, there? And the Phillies, <laughs> that is the one thing you got to be thinking if you're the Diamondbacks. The Phillies guy, the bullpen has thrown a zillion pitches. 
So if you can get into that bullpen somehow, some way, just stretch Nola's pitch count out early and you can get into that bullpen early, they're not going to have Kimbrell available. Like, they're not going to want to use... He might be better off. <laughs> right. They're not going to use Alvarado because he's thrown so many pitches. So you might get guys that they normally don't want to pitch. You know, they haven't thrown Michael Lorenz in at all. So I think you'll... Or Tywin Walker, for I that matter. I think you'll see them... A- ahead of... of- a- ahead of some of the other guys hmm. just because they're going to try and buy pitches. They have a game. They might try and do that. But they're going to also say, you know what? We've got Nola... And you've got to get by our lineup. We'll take those chances. Do you think uh, Bruce Boshi is also thinking that about our oldest Chapman? Like, you know, okay, time to put Chapman in the game. Right. The problem <laughs> is, is I don't know who else in that bullpen you turn to. You know, you well, were the clerk so the save the other night, but, yeah. and you've been leaning so heavily on him because he's definitely your best option. But I think, I think the fact that he blew the game has to make it just so tough on you now because it's not like you feel any better if you're going to go, okay, well, now I'm going to trust Araldus Chapman. Yikes. Yeah. <laughs> the he who still throws 102 miles an hour at uh, age, what, 39 or 38 or something like that. So, and, and he is, well, he's probably the weakest guy in my next category here for this is you're watching the Elite Championship Series. And so are we watching Hall of Famers play? Yes, I think we both would say that. And I think Aroldis Chapman is probably the farthest away of all the guys I could say. I can't even make a case for him. He's got 300 saves, so that's the only reason why I kind of right, mention I think him. He's not. He's not. He's a not a Hall of Famer. I think there's four guys that are definitive Hall of Famers that are playing right now. Altuve is going to make it. Okay, so he's 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 one that is not as close to the end of his career, but he's going to make it. I there's not a lot of second basemen that have his career profile and and again, and his postseason the success. postseason thing that just you know we, we we will talk about this more in another podcast, but just you know, the postseason studliness is a big plus. Him, it, it will elevate his career the same way it elevated David Ortiz's career, the same way one day it could elevate Jordan Alvarez's career. And it won't take away from Clayton Kershaw's career. No, it doesn't take away. Right, we don't, we don't, we don't subtract if a guy does, isn't as good in the playoffs as he is. I in think, th- and a guy that's been pretty good this postseason in Justice Ver- Justin Verlander, and mm-hmm. a guy that's been not so good in Max Scherzer. So there's three. Both of those guys. And Bryce Harper is going to be a Hall of Famer. Yeah, player. I think so, too. And here's another guy who, in the biggest moments, plays his best. Mm-hmm. And to me, and I was looking at Bryce Harper, and I was, I was trying to find this earlier today. So he's had an uh, on-base plus slugging uh, number over one thousand three different times in his career mm-hmm. and you know barry bonds had it like seven times and babe ruth and those guys had it like but there aren't a lot of guys that had three seasons where their ops was over a thousand and i think his his career ops plus is 143 so that that oh, being above 140 puts you kind of in a class of your own so he'll have more all-time stats right because he's think he's got 300 home runs or, or or thereabouts so he'll have more that if he plays a bunch of, more than that if he plays and a he's bunch of years really good in the postseason yeah. specifically Specifically since coming over to the Phillies. Right, right. Because I guess his, the, the Nationals would say, well, he wasn't that great when he was playing right. for us in the postseason. So, uh, but, and, and he's just the kind of player that, um, you know, uh, look, we, 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 the Phillies are hard for us to watch. But then that guy is, you, you, when he comes up to the plate or when Schwarber comes up to the plate. Right, you want to watch. I, I want to watch. It's just really interesting, sort of the redemption of Bryce Harper, who went from one of the more disliked players in baseball to one of the more liked players in baseball. And I don't know if that's just because people realize his intensity was truly genuine great point that like okay no, this isn't him try harding or him acting for the camera this is just who he this is, is who he is right or if people just kind of became more accepting of it i think because he wasn't young i think when he was a demonstrative young player people did not receive it well people don't want like it when young he's guys, not the cocky kid anymore right <laughs> people didn't like it when it came off as a cocky yeah. young yeah. kid and now he's an intense veteran so i think it's different yeah yeah and i and i think you're right it is genuine and like like i said his his at bats and then watching the freak in schwerber going every time he's up there he'll he can look horrible in one at bat and just hit an absolute rocket like he did last night 450 44 feet was his 444 and and Bryce Harper's with 460 feet yeah these are like two home runs in like I think three that's what makes the Philly lineup so tough is that you make a mistake to any guy in that lineup and they can punish you by hitting the ball out of the ballpark so I would put out that you also could consider that we we, we, we throw said Chapman's definitely not Trey Turner I he's got he's got to play a lot more years okay I, I, it feels like without looking we're not going to go looking at stats and say without looking like, at a stat 
has five more years at this level? Yeah, he's got to have like five or six more years at this that's level. That's what comes to and my that's mind. That's too many for me to say he's on a track because it's really tough to project guys playing at a Hall of Fame level. It's like if you were going to say that, then there's like 30 guys in the major leagues that are potential Hall of Famers. He's going to have one of the Jay Jaffe's jaws. He's going to have a great like five, seven year, right. excellent profile. Where but he's, like he's got to have a few more of them before I start putting him in that category. Otherwise, I just have to say there's too many guys in the major leagues that might be Hall of Fame worthy. I, I didn't compare his stats to Altuve. I think Altuve's played a little longer, he's like played two longer, or three years yeah. longer or something like that. But I think Trey Turner is on the track, and if he can maintain the level of production that he even put together in the second half of the season, let's forget right. about the first half, for the next four or five years, I think he will get there. He will have all-time stats. And how about the guy I mentioned before who, you know, you know I guess he's one of the greatest closers of all time, even though he's late in his career and just a powder keg ready, ready to go off when he goes in there now in, in Craig Kimbrell. Um, just without looking at stats, so I already told you he's got, he's got more than the 300 saves. I think he's got 400 saves, actually. Um, what do you think? Kimbrell, it's tough for me. I don't like it. He doesn't feel like a Hall of Fame closer, but he probably is because it's him and Jansen from this era. So... I think he ends up there just because for lack of somebody else, and it's kind of hard not to put him in if you're going to put Jansen in. And, I, you know, closers, obviously, you know, I guess they should have a, a, a bit more of a problem. Billy Wagner's still not in. They 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 give him the innings, not having quite enough innings to do mm-hmm. that. Um, you've got guys like Chapman. You've got, you know, that, you know, not quite good enough. There really isn't a, a Mariano Rivera right. like, if, generational if, if, closer if here. You have to be Mariano Rivera to get in as a closer, then – Basically, no one's ever going in as a closer again. So I would agree that if I right now, if I had to say, I'd say Kimbrell probably not, but you could be surprised. Right, and, I think Kimbrell will probably end up in because if you're going to put Jansen in, who I think will get in, Kimbrell will get in. Yeah, I don't know. I, it's interesting, it's interesting. I don't know if Jansen will get in. I'm not as sure about that, but may, maybe they'll both get in because you know they're, they're kind of the same. Um, I think they have about the same amount of saves. Um, Manager-wise, Dusty Baker and Bruce Boshi. I think Boshi was already going to go in the Hall of Fame before he mm-hmm. started to come back and ruin it because he's got to wait another five years now. Dusty, when he's done. Dusty, probably if he wins this year, he's a slam dunk. Then, yes, I would say so. I would say one hundred percent for sure. And we'll talk about him in a minute because we, we've got something to discuss on him as well. Um, and I thought GM wise, Dave Dombrowski of the Phillies, I think he's got a chance to be in the Hall of Fame. Right, he's probably in a similar thing where if. The Phillies win the World Series. He he gets closer to slam dunk territory. And the reason that I think that he is that because he's one of the few guys who can actually do it through free agency, right? He's not doing it through, through building organizational, you know, strain top to bottom in the minor leagues. He's able to go out and pick like, the right I'm going to go buy a bunch of guys and, and, gonna work. and shuffle the decks and we're going to have a great team. And he's done this so many times now, uh, Red Sox and... And Marlins. Yeah, you you got to give him a nod. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I think uh, of all the guys. And and it's interesting that we're talking about that because you've got the uh, contemporary era committee uh, that uh, released its ballot this week. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I guess I don't know any of the people that were on the voting committee, which is kind of interesting. I mean, we don't. Uh, do we need to know who's on the voting committee? No, but like, like who? So these folks just put together the ballot of who gets nominated. Right, exactly. Uh, but it's it's nobody I've ever heard. Of. I don't think there's one person and I won't I won't mention them them here. Um, um, but the the guys that are there, and what has to happen is, I think three quarters of the people that vote, and we don't know who the voters yet are because they haven't released the names of the actual voters. Um, there are a bunch of managers, and this is this is contemporary year, so this is not Rule B. And uh, and just to remember our, our our conversation with Cooperstown Dave, Dave Metter, um, the Rule B candidates did more than one thing, as you right. as, as you point out. These are guys who are just you know, hey, they they didn't get you know pick when they were in there. We're going to take another look at their careers. Um, and the first guy on the list that I've got here is Cito Gaston. He of the two consecutive World Series that he managed for the Toronto Blue Jays back in the 90s. Um, and I guess, you know, winning two World Series just puts you on the cusp, right? You may or may not get in on the he basis of that. He was also the that. first black manager to win a World Series. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if that's a reason to go in the Hall I of Fame. I just think that's a itself. notable achievement in the history of baseball. That's something that you would note. 
So I think that that, that becomes a talking point for him. He did win 894 games in right, only right. 12 years. But, you know, you kind of want to see a manager win like 1,000 games or something right. like that. I, I feel like 12 ma- years of as a manager just isn't quite I, enough. I think so. That's going to be his so. biggest issue. And and you, you know, they mentioned here that he had an 11-year playing career. This is not a Rule B candidate kind of a guy in my mind, Cito Gaston. Like the sum total of his, of his playing and his managing career doesn't make him maybe a better candidate over there, but I don't have him going in here. Who's the next guy you got? We have Davey Johnson. Yeah, I'm a Met fan, so I'm going to probably be in favor of that. <laughs> right. He was a manager for 17 years, managed the Mets, the Reds, the Orioles, the Dodgers, and the Nationals. He won manager of the year twice, I think in 97 and 2012. Won a World Series with the Mets as a manager in 86. And he was also a player, though I don't really... He was a very good player and, and was one of those guys on that Atlanta Brave team in 1973. There were four guys to hit 40 home runs, uh, and he was one of them. And that's, that's, that's forgotten as a second baseman. He was also the guy that hit the last ball in the 1969 World Series that Cleon Jones caught on one knee. <laughs> yeah, so, so, and then he came to manage the Mets. Uh, I you know, think he, he's probably a better Rule B candidate than he is a contemporary year can- candidate. But let's see uh, who else is there. How about Jim Leland? There's another guy you know who i thought he had won two world series and he hasn't he only mm. won one world series however he managed the pirates marlins rockies and tigers uh and he uh won the 97 world series title with the marlins uh and he he got manager of the year three times uh and he finished second uh for that award three three times so he's he's got a lot of cred he's built some teams right he feels like the strongest candidate just as an overall manager right now just for the number of wins at almost 1800 three managers of the year he's got a world series title he's got to win two yeah (laughs) he's got to win two i mean there's so many guys that are like that i think that what's trouble is the next guy i'll be honest i don't know what at all Ed Montague? Not at all. Oh, he's an umpire. Well, right, exactly. So I, I don't want to talk about But the fact is, is that I would rather put in <laughs> a bunch of managers than put in no, right. more than one umpire of any a umpires. a bunch of playoffs, worked six World Series. Good umpire, very fine. Good world, very good. He was a crew chief for the World Series in 97, 2000, 04, and 07. So he was the crew chief at the Red Sox, breaking the curse, which I think is pretty cool. Hmm. But no, it's, uh, <laughs> umpires, umpires are tough because I feel like that's something that people that are even more intimately connected to baseball would know about. Like, I feel like you almost have to be part of the teams or the, the, the organizations to really get a sense for how an umpire affected stuff. Because as a fan, I'm too removed from it. Right, right. I think the players are, are the better. So, oh, he was an excellent umpire. It was easy to talk to. I, I, I felt like he was fair. Uh, Ed Montague, I remember when he umpired and all that. I couldn't tell you there was another umpire named Doug Harvey. There was all these guys. I, I couldn't tell you who's the better umpire, who should make it or who should not. So it's really hard for me to pick. I, like I said, I'd rather pick more managers mm-hmm. than, than pick an umpire. Now, Hank Peters is nuts. And he was a um, uh, St. Louis Browns, uh, now the Orioles, and Reds before he became an A's GM in 1965. Um, there are a lot of guys that are GMs that, you know, that Roland Heeman, he was talked about as the Orioles GM and a really a guy that should get I think a good the thing, look. If you're a GM, did he win a World Series? Uh, the World Series in 83, he won, yes. Okay, he got one. Yes, yes. Because I feel like that's the number one thing for my front front off executive. you got to got to put up a bunch of those. For and me then there. he went to Cleveland before they moved into Jacobs Field, or it was then called Jacobs Field, and, and sort of put together that good team that almost won a World Series in 1995, but did not. Um, the next guy, though, I think is the guy. Lou Pinella? Yeah, yeah. You think he's going to get the vote? I think he's going to get the vote, and yet I think he's probably, of all these guys, the strongest Rule B candidate. Because he was pretty good at both. <laughs> he was he was the best player of the last manager of these. Of the, in fact, he did both of those better than all the other guys. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, Lou Pinella managed 23 seasons. I guess I didn't realize that he did that. And and if you watched him manage at the time, all you remember him is like throwing bases and stuff and right. kicking dirt. But he has 1,800 <laughs> career wins. Yeah, yeah. He has a World Series. Only one, though. But he has won. Only one. Which is important. He has the record for the best regular season of all time. Yeah. With the O1 cool Mariners. Thing. Yeah. And he was manager of the league three times. He and he had a career two ninety one average and played eighteen years in the major leagues. It's pretty good. Let me take the other side of the O one Mariners thing. So let's 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 see. Let's not look at what happened to them in the postseason. <laughs> 
<laughs> Let's see. When they need, they had the greatest team in regular season history, yeah, but, and, and they, they were, burned out in the, there was, like the first round of the playoffs. playoffs. Like, like is the manager doesn't own that. <laughs> he doesn't own that either. It's yeah, all in the, yeah. that's on the players' net. That's on the players. <laughs> so yeah, but only winning one, uh, I think, is is kind of interesting. And and then you've got a guy who's retiring, who you've actually watched. Who is an umpire I know in Joe West, who I think it, it will probably get in just because he's so well respected. I, I think guess. I guess. I, I, I guess everybody talks about him as being like the umpire. You know what I mean? Yeah, I fine. I I, I, I guess I I, we, I think I get away with my mind like like four umpires being in the Hall of Fame. Right, that's not I fair. don't really need any more that's umpires to be in the Hall of Fame. Because <laughs> there are already four umpires in there. I, I, I mean, so it, isn't the best never, time pairing when you don't notice them at all? Right, but we need to recognize their careers. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. I guess, I guess. And and the last guy on the list was a guy that you probably wouldn't know anything about. Um, he played, I was a little kid, and he was finishing what was a, an excellent playing career, which I don't think people even realize. And then he was president of the National League, Bill White. Um, what I remember about Bill White is he was in the booth for the Yankees for years with Phil Rizzuto um, and Tony Kubek and I, I want to say one of the fields I played on as a little kid was Bill White Field. No, that's Bill Terry. Oh, okay. In different different guy and not the bill terry that played for the giants just a guy from a guy that lived down his name bill terry like the great giant uh yeah you know player so bill white um because he was the first uh african-american president of the uh of the national league and because he was such a good player and 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 a you know and a, an important executive i like him actually i'll take him over joe west i'll take him over ed montague if they're going to be if something if you're going to get the vote with these guys this is a guy to think he contributed to baseball, and maybe that makes him a Rule B candidate, but I don't think he'll ever get in as a Rule B candidate because his playing career was really good, not great, and the rest of it is kind of hard to assess unless you're going to really... got seven gold gloves. Yeah, right. He's an eight-time All-Star. Right, right. That's more than I think a lot of these other guys on this list can say about their playing career. So um, I guess we'll, we'll wait and the the... I guess the voters will be announced, and this comes out in like a December, so maybe we'll have Dave back and we'll talk about uh, you know these guys to see <laughs> who makes it. But, I mean, if anybody else out there has any ideas of who should go in from this group, who should get voted in, or anybody you think that should have been nominated and wasn't, please reach out and let us know. We're always looking to hear from people. And uh, it should be a fun end of the LCS, and I can't wait to see what our World Series matchup will be. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and, and thanks for listening. We're, we're getting ready for some interesting off-season episodes because we've been doing two a week when we're doing this week in baseball. So we're going to be doing some different things, I think, to kind of keep it interesting in the off-season. Yeah. Uh, but we've still got a lot more cool baseball to talk about.